First of all, these slides are already on the web right now. Uh, I will repeat the URL at the end, so you don't have to write it right now. Um, but the important point is that the slides are in, H in HTML, so all the links are live and you can follow them. So I wait until the photo is made. Okay, one, done, good. So before I go into all the details, just a few words, words about W3C because I, I presume that most of the audience here is familiar with IDPF and may not be that familiar with what W3C is all about. Um, it's a same structured member-based uh, international consortium as IDPF. It was founded by uh, Tim Berners-Lee, I'm sorry, I should say Sir Timothy Berners-Lee um, in 94. Um, last time I checked, which was about two or three weeks ago, uh, there were 420 members, and it has a staff of about 75 people spread really all over the globe, um, around and, and centered around four hosts, as we call them, which are the copyright holders and the leaders of the whole thing, um, and MIT at Beihang University in Beijing, at Keio University nearby uh, Tokyo in Japan, and Ursim, which is a strange organization in the south of France. Um, and I don't want to go into that because that gets wrong. Uh, it focuses on the web ecosystem, so when you hear household names like HTML, CSS, MathML, they are uh, done by W3C. Some of the household names are not done by W3C, like JavaScript, uh, but are used by JavaScript uh, by, by W3C. Uh, develops for users, developers, browsers, etc. And we use this strange term of open web platform that we have heard before, which is nothing else than just a kind of a name of of all of these together. So, you know, it's it's a it's a collection of all these technologies that we develop and and we use. Um, in 2012, we started a series of joint workshops with IDPF. So we had the very first one in New York, then we had one in Paris, we had one in Tokyo, uh, which were looking at the connection between the digital publishing world and the web. Um, and then as a result of this series of workshops and, and discussions around it, we set up the W3C Digital Publishing Interest Group in May 2013, and it has been happily working ever since. Uh, it has uh, weekly teleconferences, lots of emails, uh, two, usually two face-to-face -face meetings, or at least virtual face-to-face -face meetings um, every year. Uh, Marcus here is one of the co-chairs of the interest group, and Svia Zygman from uh, Wiley, whom you may know, is the other co-chair. Um, the mission, the reason why we set up the whole thing was because uh, we realized that uh, the digital publishing community uses the W3C technologies, but is not around the table when those technologies are developed. And, you know, the way it works in an organization like that, that those who are around the table have more weight in, you know, in setting the priorities than those who are not. And that was not a good state to be. So um, we tried to get together all the experts who were familiar in all these technologies and, and try to identify those issues uh, that the digital publishing community needs or needed or needs and that are not covered by the open web platform CSS, HTML, or others, and then try to push these issues to the relevant groups. Sometimes, more or less successfully, try to push people into these groups to do the work, um, and then you know achieve certain things and achieve certain advances. And I will give some uh, results of the advances that we made in the past two years. And since about a good year, we are working on the portable web publications, and I will. Uh, come back on that to give more details what that is. So just a few results of the past two years. The list is not exhaustive, um, and it's not even saying all the details. Layout and styling is one of the obvious areas. The digital publishing community has obviously very, sometimes very stringent re uh, requirements on how styling should be done. Um, and, you know, uh, the CSS does or does not do that. So we have to 
uh, document all the issues that are raised there. So we began, and it's a kind of an ongoing, uh, some would say a living document, um, which is the requirement of Latin text layout and pagination, which collects all these kind of issues. Now, why Latin text, you would say? There are other writing systems in this world, and there are. Um, the point is that W3C, even before we began to work on digital publishing, has already had some extremely serious work in other languages, in other reading systems. One of the best one, and I think up to now the most complete one, is the Japanese uh, you know, requirements for Japanese text layout and, and pagination. It's quite an amazing document. If you are really interested, it's worth looking at. Uh, but there are groups working on Chinese, on Korean, and there are people who tried to set up a similar one for Indian. But funnily enough, all these things were going on and nobody was talking about Latin text because that's so easy, right? We, we all know what has to be done and there is no pr complication and yeah. So we saw that this is not that simple and that's why we started with this work, which is the Latin text pagination. And uh, it has already influenced some of the CSS work and its ongoing effect uh, is still visible. Uh, I refer to some of the documents, some of the CSS documents, uh, which have been at least partially influenced by this work and even edited by some people in the uh, in this community, Dave Kramer, for uh, pardon me. Um, and that's one of the areas. In parallel to that, there is also another document which is evolving, which is a priorities for CSS. I mean, CSS has, I don't know, 200 modules, 300, something, well, okay, yeah. Let's say 99. Um, and which of those 99 modules have a really high priority for publishing is, is not clear. And, and, and we try to set up a priority. These are really interesting for us. Uh, you know, table layout and alignment in table layout is one of the, the, the examples that come up uh, and, and other things like that. And so we have a document which is also evolving, which collects really issues, you know, uh, pictures of books that are real books that are created and that we want to re reproduce in terms of CSS and that again is a is a work done together with the CSS working group and we hope to influence them. Actually um, this issue has already been uh, raised several times today. Uh, Alex talked about that but others as well. Uh, the fact of having moved to HTML has one downside is that we lose the structural richness that XML has. And in some cases, that kind of information is lost and it's not good. Uh, so there is a need to add structural information to the HTML structure. Um, and that's a work that was done in IDPF uh, with the infamous EPUB column type, uh, which doesn't uh, work with HTML5 anymore. So there are issues around that. Uh, so we were looking at ways on how to get this vocabulary, at least part of that vocabulary, into this brave new world where we work with HTML and what, what should be done in this area. I don't want to go into all the details of what happened there. For the time being, what is going on is that there is a module uh, which is bound to a work, a separate work at W3C, which is called Way Aria, uh, which defines a number of values and attributes uh, around the role attribute, uh, which describe and give uh, structural information. And we defined a separate document, which is now undergoing the usual W3C uh, you know, process to get as a recommendation, which describes a number of these structural elements, uh, like appendix or, or these kind of things. Now, why is it important that it is ARIA? Because the ARIA work has, a, in a sense, two sides. One is that you have these attributes, but it has also, for each of these attributes, a direct mapping defined down to the assistive technologies of the various operating systems, so in Linux or Windows or, or Mac. And so there is a bridge that is created between the terms that were originally used by EPUB and which are now mapped down, well, will be mapped down to assistive technology. So that, in a sense, we gain two things because obviously these values can be used outside the X 
accessibility work, but it's also valid and useful and important for the accessibility work. So I think that's, that's good. Annotation has been around forever since we have books. Uh, and it's not only text, but sometimes drawings, not always, sometimes a bit more friendly drawings than up there. But, uh, you know, these annotations have been around, I think it's a, a 12th century manuscript with some annotations put there by monks while they were a bit bored, clearly. Um, so we collected a use case document on what annotation has to, can be used for and how it is used in the terms of uh, digital publishing. Now, this work actually uh, left, so to say, the digital publishing interest group because W3C partially on the, as a result of this work created a separate working group uh, which picked up some specification which came from a different group. I, you know, I don't want to go into the whole history here, but there is now a, a working group that defines standards for how to model and how to exchange uh, annotation structures. Uh, the hope uh, is that this working group will finish with a recommendation by the end of this year. It may shift to early next year, but I hope that's really the maximum shift. And the last one I want to quote is a document that actually is still undergoing some changes, which is a note on DPUB accessibility. Again, something that I don't know whether it was Alex or Danielle referred to that, uh, maybe both. Um, the fact is that on the one hand, we have work egg and we have had work egg for a while, but that co doesn't cover certain issues that are necessary for digital publishing. So a group of people wearing W3C hat produce this document to look at the, uh, the, uh, the work egg and what is missing, what, what has to be added or how it has to be modified. And then essentially the same people put on their EPUB working group hat and then it's influencing the work around 3.1. So we have a, a lot of people who are in both groups here. So the major work which is coming up is the portable web publications. And now I really jump in time. I was speaking about the past, and now I jump ahead a bit more in the future. I put there uh, EPUB plus web because we spent quite a lot of time on trying to find what the best name for this beast is. There was a time when it was called EPUB plus web, and then for various reasons, we switched to PWP. I certainly do not claim that this is the best name of the world. Um, and, you know, lots of brownie points for somebody who can come up with a better name. Uh, but for the time being, let's live with that. So the main message that, uh, at least for us who were at the origin of this work, uh, started this, is that digital publishing and web publishing should not be different. These things are the same thing. So if you do digital publishing, you do web publishing. Which actually, because we learned in mathematics that equality is symmetric, which also means that web publishing, when I publish something on the web, is the same as digital publishing. Uh, there is no really difference between the two. And that's, that's sort of the simple message that should direct whatever we do. Um, so what does it mean in practice? Uh, that the separation between online publishing as website and, and separation between offline publishing, which can or cannot be or, or should not be packaged, these differences should diminish to zero eventually. So publication of a web content uh, can be loaded into the browser or can be loaded into a special application, whatever the user wants. Uh, whatever he or she prefers. The publication can be on the local disk or can be on the web. It should not be different. It is always the same publication and not convert it from one format to the other. That's something we have to do these days. And the content should be authored regardless of what state uh, the publication is. This is just the same in a nice diagraphic form uh, that the, you know, whether it is on, on a mobile uh, packaged or whether it is on a website and you read it, the same thing. It's the same publication. So of course, the real question is why the hell do we do that? Well, why, why do we want to so do something like that? So let me take an example. This is uh, this was originally the PhD thesis of one of my former colleagues at W3C. Uh, it was the first ever EPUB that I produced uh, years ago, manually. 
Um, and this is a book uh, which happens to be now in the browser, and I want to be able to read it just like I do with a web page. So I should be able to follow the links out of the page, uh, create bookmarks, if I have useful tools and plugins in my browser, I want to get, make use of it. I want to create annotations, etc. Sometimes I may need extra computing power, like 3D. Well, not for this tag. This is a legal text, so there is only text in it. But in some other cases, I may need something much stronger than that. On the other hand, by other times, I may want to use my dedicated server because, God forbid, I want to lead a, a, a legal text on the beach, uh, which probably is a bad idea. Um, but it should be the same book. It shouldn't be, you know, I have something there which I format through 10 tools to something that I can read in an EPUB format. It should be the same thing. I may not be online. Somebody, I don't, must admit, I don't remember who already referred to this example. Probably it was, it was Bill, actually. Uh, that, that, you know, I may be sometimes offline, I may be sometimes online. Oh, no, it was Micah. Sorry. Um, and, you know, I may find this article on the web. I commute every day from where I live to the institute where I work. I want to be able to read it, annotate it, and when I am back offline, from offline to online, I want those annotations to go back to my annotation server that, let's say, my department wants to access. Scholarly publishing, I mean, we are not only talking about books. I think this is something that we have to emphasize over and over again. Scholarly publishing the default version of publication for scholarly publishing is on the web, is not EPUB. It's on the web, you have articles on the web, but today scholarly publishing means a linear text with a linear story, but it also means all kinds of data, all kinds of graphics, video, audio, JavaScript programs that, you know, uh, make drawings of the data and all these things. This is the publication, which is online, maybe, but sometimes I want to read it because, let's say I'm a researcher, I want to review that paper. Today, the only thing I can do is I convert it to PDF and I try to put it on my uh, iPhone or my iPad or iPad mini, and then I try to read it and annotate it on my iPad mini. Good luck with it. It's really a big pain. So you want the same thing to be movable between the states without problems easily and etc. Educational publication. The borderline between what is a web application and what is a publication as a book, in the case of educational publications, has become really, really fuzzy these days. Uh, you know, a book is, it, what is an educational publication? It's a book that requires offline access. It's an application on the web which communicates with servers and all kinds of tools outside. Uh, is it an interactive data container? Uh, it's a testing environment which interacts with the user. All this is an EPA public, is an educational publication. And the fact that it is online or it is on your reader or in your, in your device uh, is just because that's the way it is at the moment, but the publication is the same. There are synergy effects of the convergence here, which we should not forget. What is the advantage for the publisher's community um, if uh, this convergence happens? Well, publishers can finally concentrate on what they know better, or at, at least they claim to know better, which is produce, edit, curate content. This is their expertise. They, don't, we don't, I mean, we being web people, we don't have this expertise. Publishers have that. Publishers are not technology companies, and we all know that the, that, that, you know, a very few technical people are working by publishers these days compared to the needs they have with the structure we have today. Instead, they should rely on that huge, very lively community of web developers, which are just about everywhere and where you have starts up born in every city every day. Now, this is not a one directional thing. Here in this audience, uh, it's mainly publishers or, or the community around it. I know that for the web community, the publishers can bring a lot of things. Publishers have much more experience in 
in ergonomy, in typography, in aesthetics of how to present text, mainly when that text is very long. You know, not all publication is 240 characters. Some of them may be a little bit longer. And how you present that and how you make it understandable is not at all an easy thing to do. And, well, let's be honest. If I look at the web pages out there and the websites, well, some of them are fairly ugly and unreadable, right? I mean, there are, there are things to do there. Uh, this example, which, which is there, is actually a very nice example, which comes from the early 19th century of a person who made a book on Euclidean elements, uh, but with diagrams and colors, etc. And I think it is the University of British Columbia that put it in PDF on the web, and it looks gorgeous. But it shows that there are people who already, a long time ago, tried to understand how to convey information in a better way, in an ergonomic way, and the web has to learn that because it has not yet learned it. You guys know that. We don't. So how do we get here, technically? And the big warning is that everything I say here is subject to change. You know, we are speculating. We, are, we have been trying to understand this field. We have been trying to understand what is going on. And everything is subject to change. So first of all, there is a fundamental challenge, which is the terminology we use. What is a portable web publication? Now, the interesting thing is that if you are on the web, there is a concept to have a document, a web page. You have an address for it. There is no concept of the, on the web properly which says it is a collection of resources on the web. It is the web page. It is all the CSS, the fonts, the graphics. Possibly it's not one HTML file, but it is 15. And it's the whole thing together that has an identity and not the individual constituents. That notion on the web today doesn't exist. We have to create it, because this is, this is the essential part of it. And we also have to have this notion of whatever is there, what is the essential content? What is absolutely essential to be there if I go offline? And what are those things that, well, if you don't have it, you can live without it? The, the example that we have been using in our discussions are fonts. In some cases, fonts is a kind of a nice to have. But it's perfectly OK if I move to offline and I use the, the system fonts of you know, Helvetica or whatever. And if I am online and I use some esoteric font, the content is the same and it may be, the, it may be fine. In other cases, this is not the case, because I may have fonts that contain mathematical symbols. And it's absolutely essential that that font would travel with the documents offline. So what essential is and what is not essential is, is subjective. There has to be a way to somehow describe these are the web resources together as a unit, and these are the elements of the resources that are essential if you go offline. So we are talking about certain types of publications, a journal or a magazine article including, as I said, all the relevant CSS files. An educational article which may contain JavaScript or even Java code to do all the, the, the exercises for, for users or teachers. A novel or a poem on the web, including all the fonts and the CSS and whatever is necessary. But we are not talking about a web mail application. That's not what we are interested in. Uh, we will not want to put Facebook or Renren on Twitter online. I mean, you know, those are separate animals. These are not really publication in this sense. Now, again, the borderline is obviously fuzzy, and we will have to find the, 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 the more specific specification for that, but that's the direction. Of course, there are differences whether I am offline or not, and there are differences whether it is packaged or not. We cannot ignore that, but to make the point uh, we refer that in our terminology as states. It's the same document that may have different states. It can be online, it can be offline, it can be packed or unpacked. But overall, a certain level of abstraction, what we want is that these states sort of disappear. I mean, they are just states of the same publication. So 
how can we envisage an, uh, an architecture that can handle these kind of, of things, PWPs? So we, we are talking about a conceptual client-side, or mainly client-side processor, that tries to hide the, the specificities of the different states uh, to the rest of the rendering engine. Uh, so the main rendering engine should see a publication always as if it was on the web and as if it was unpacked. Because this is then how a web browser works, because then the main rendering engine becomes essentially the web browser or any special application which has a web browser packaged in it. And the PWP processor, as we refer to it, should hide all the state differences, possible cache, and whatever is necessary. So if I put that in diagramic format, I mean, this is the way the usual, it usually works on the web. You issue a request. We are HTTP, as we call it, and it returns and it displays. If I have this PWB processor, it sort of sits locally there. It catches all the requests. So the requests are under the control of the PWP processor, which may decide, depending on what happened locally, it may decide to go out to the web and really fetch something, but maybe it has everything in the cache. And if it, is, if it has things in the cache, you can just as well be offline because it will not go and it will not try to fetch something online. And whether it is packaged or not, the PWP processor can make the unpackaging on the fly. That's no problem. It's still hidden. And what's really important is that this part here is the same, is the same rendering engine, is the same browser. Obviously. This is a draft, as I said. And of course, the question that you have is, is this approach at least feasible, or is it just story? Well, actually, coincidentally, and I really say coincidentally, because when we began that work, we didn't even realize that this is important. But there is a work going on in the web, web world which does exactly that. It is creating a truly parallel engine which is part of a browser. The jargon is uh, service workers. And that engine does exactly that. It catches all the requests for the web, and it tries to look whether the content is cached locally or not. And if it is cached, well, then it doesn't go to the network. Everything is handled offline. And the main rendering engine is unaware of the fact whether it uses the, the, the content from the cache or it uses something online. It's a work in progress. It's not yet an existing W3C standard, but there are, you know, it's already existing in Chrome. As far as I know, it is, being un it is under development in, in uh, Mozilla, uh, and I think also in Edge. I'm not absolutely sure about the last one. And so a PWP processor could be implemented in such a modern environment by using this approach. And actually, this is not only a wide idea. Uh, Daniel there, over there, he can talk more about it because they made an experimentation of something like that in Radium. They made a kind of a experimental setup uh, using service workers and the fundamental thing worked. And actually, when we had a meeting on the last face-to-face -face meeting in, uh, what was that, November, uh, in Japan, then the editor of the service worker document was there uh, he talked to us. He was pretty happy. Then he flew home uh, to uh, uh, to London, I think. And on the on the plane, he came up with some sort of a mock-up environment where he implemented the whole thing and unpackaged it. And then Dave Kramer picked it up and created a. What was the name of the editor you created? Oh, Acme Publishing. Yeah, Acme Publishing, which which sort of does you know. Is, is, is really trying out whether this technology works. It works. Of course, there are lots of things that have to be sorted out. But it's there. It's doable. Another technical challenge that has to be addressed somehow is related to addressing an identification. So first of all, there is one thing that, that you know, it's a stake on the ground that we have to put, is that addressing and identification are very different things. And the two roles are really, really different. The usual situation is that you have some form of a URI that is used to uniquely identify the resource. And you have an HTTP URL that 
addresses that resource on the web. In some cases, these two roles can be the same, but in some cases they are not. So you may have an ISBN to identify the book, but that's not an address on the web. It's not necessarily an address on the web. And you have an address on the web to identify that. These two roles are really different from one another. Identification is taken care of, bad or good, but that's not my me to say, but it's taken care of by a number of organizations for DOI, for, for public, scientific publications, ISBN agency, etc. And the stake in the ground is that we want, don't want to get into that business. Identification is not our role, is not our business. Let them sort it out. We work only on what's web technology. That means locate things on the web. Now, even when we address something on the web, which we locate something on the web, we have to separate the different concerns because we may want to address the PWP as a unit itself. As I said at the beginning, one of the major points is that we have an identification for a collection of web resources and we have to, to go through all the various hooplas to what this means, but we need that URL on the web. And then we may want to have a URL for one of the constituents, one of the chapters. And then again, within the chapter, we want to address something because we need that. Now, the good thing is that three and two, they are taken care of web technologies. And let's, it's a question of a principle. Let's make use of anything that is already out there. Do not reinvent any wheel. So we have fragment identification. We have other means. The web annotation working group is working on something called selectors. Let them sort it out. But that's how we can get into one specific resource. And we have the real web addresses that we all know and we all love, which are all there for individual constituencies. So really the issue is the locator for the whole PWP itself. And then, of course, uh, there may be differences uh, depending on the states, because there is one locator which is for the package version and the other one which is for the unpacked version. The, BFF version, let's put it this way, uh, which has to have an address. So which locator should we use? Uh, and how should the, the resources within the PWP work? That's the question, again, that we have to answer. At the moment, where we are is that we actually talk about a canonical locator. There has to be a canonical locator that is absolutely independent of what state the PWP is in. Whether it is packaged, whether it is unpackaged, it's the same locator which sort of not identifies in terms of ISBN, but well, addresses in terms of, of, of the web the specific locator. And then there might be state-dependent locators, and there are relationship among them, and the PWP processor has to have an access to all these locators to be able to you know, go through the various mutual references depending on whether it is offline, whether it was unpacked, etc. Um, so that's essentially the, uh, the direction we go. So it's again back to the PWP processor that can take care of the rest if it has all this information somehow and we have to, to work out exactly how this information has to get there. And you remember this is what I said on an earlier slide that the client-side processor hides the specificities into the PWP processor and everything else works as if it was on the web, as if it was unpacked. It's crucial in this whole approach that there has to be manifests. Manifests that include metadata, but manifests that also include these locators. And in fact, the real question that we have to solve is, if I have the locator, uh, the canonical locator, how do I get to the manifest? Once I have this manifest, I have everything. It sort of bootstraps the whole operation. Again, details have to be worked out. I cite a very short and third technical challenge just to show that there are things that are very different from the previous one. Um, the tradition between uh, publishing and digital publishing and the web on what the user can do with the content is vastly different. We have heard about that several times here, that in an e any EPUB reader, I can change the font size. I can change the font color. 
maybe, not always. I can change the background color and things of that sort. And, and it's really good. It's, it's something that, that I think our readers have, have learned to use and, and use them a lot, etc. Let's realize that on the web, we don't have that. I, I am very unhappy about it, but on an average website with an average browser, I cannot just go there and say, I want to change the background color because it's better for my eyes. This kind of control is not in the culture of web browsers today. There has been some early attempts in CSS on setting up, you know, local, what was the official name, user style sheets or something? User content of CSS. Yeah, uh, these kind of things. But only some hackers could really handle that. And the browsers do not give you any user interaction to be able to do that. So in this case, uh, it's partially a kind of a technical difference where we have to find a common ground, but it's also a kind of a cultural or traditional difference between the two worlds that has to be reconciled. That may be much more difficult and much longer than solving the technical issues. But that's the way it is. So how do we get there practically? We have IDPF, we have W3C, we may have other groups. On long terms, some, PD, some elements of the PWP, it's not clear which ones, but several ones, have to go through some formal specification, so formal standardization. It requires a consensus because this is the way standardization works, and we will have to create the necessary groups somewhere in some organization. How? I cannot say. Um, the Digital Publishing IG as I said, originally worked on other things. And this document appeared two years ago? Mm -hmm. Two years ago as some sort of a, a vision document coming out of some discussions that originally he and I had. And then Svia came into the picture and joined the discussion. And that's how we had an early vision document, which was still called EPUB, EPUB plus web. First, it was EPUB dash web and then EPUB plus web, so it had several uh, layers. And then a year ago, it was adopted uh, in the course of rechartering as a kind of an official document of the interest group uh, stating that this is what's guiding a lot of the technical work within the interest group. But OK, this is a W3C jargon, and interest group is not entitled to define a standard, it's just you know, discussing technical things, so it, it cannot issue a standard. But it, you know, all the things that I have discussed here, the terminology, the locator, all these kind of things, have been discussed in various task forces within the interest group in the past year. What about EPUB? Is there a storm coming? Um, PWP doesn't replace 3.1. I mean, this is something that he talked about. But we have to realize that many of the structures that are described and, di and discussed within EPUB 3.1 already go in direction of PWP. Let's put it another way, whatever work comes out of the work in EPUB 3.1, at some point in time in the future, it is kind of an input to the work at PWP. Uh, the work on BFF is an obvious example, but there may be others. On the other hand, there has been other direction because, as I said, the work of PWP may influence what's happening in 3.1 already, not only in the area of BFF, uh, some of the structural semantics work that we have, uh, we have had, for example, may find its way to 3.1, so there is a mutual relationship. What we have to realize, because for publishers this may be a very frightening thing, that everything will change again. Uh, PWP does not change anything on the real content. It's always the same HTML, CSS, SVG, MathML content. Uh, and there is no intention in the PWP work to change any of that. That's just there. And what you produce is the same. What changes is sort of the surrounding you know, superstructure, the metadata, the, manifo the, the manifest, the way the whole thing is organized. Uh, but for the content, things are essentially unchanged. 
And for the future of EPUBs, that's even more crystal ball issue. Um, there are voices and discussions about, you know, is there a difference between a future version of EPUB uh, and PWP that whether is the same thing or whether PWP is a kind of a more general structure which may have profiles, EPUB direction or for online magazines, for example. Uh, these are all discussions that are coming and will come and to be discussed. I mean, these are just ideas that are thrown to the, how do they say, they put spaghetti on the wall and whatever sticks, right? Um, so this is, this is a bit the, where we are. So some references, um, these are the links to the wiki of our interest group. There is the latest official draft and there is an editor's draft. For the time being, the two are more or less the same, but they may change in the coming version. We work on GitHub. You can put in issues for, the, uh, for PWP at any time. Please do. Uh, this presentation is over there. Um, actually, by some sort of a coincidence, uh, I go to a web conference next week where I will also make a presentation on PWP, but because it is really to web experts, it goes into more technical details that I, I did here. So there is a link to that presentation if you want to, to go there and look at the more the technical things. And here are my contacts. Thank you for your attention.